Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please move to your seats. I hate to interrupt all the good fellowship that's going on and the conversations, but uh, uh, being it that I'm a military officer, it's my job to make sure we get started on time. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please move to your seats. Remind everybody we have a full agenda and we need to get the program going and I appreciate everybody being here today with us. Good afternoon. My name is Jack Fox. I am the New Mexico Secretary for the Department of Veterans Services. It is indeed an honor for me to be with you here today. We are here today to participate in a critical conversation about America's role in the world and why that role matters to our local communities. Here in New Mexico, the United States Global Leadership Coalition has assembled a distinguished group of leaders, of individuals, Democrats and Republicans, business leaders, leaders from faith, humanitarians, civic officials, military veterans. Each of these individuals believe that America must continue its role as a global leader. Now, it's no secret that recently there's been a lot of discussion about that role, both on Capitol Hill and probably around your dinner tables. What is the America's role in the world today? I know that everyone in this room understands the interconnectivity that the world has today, that our security and prosperity also are part of that world. And America is an indispensable nation and will always be so. We must lead. We cannot pull back. It is simply not in our interest to pull back from that global leadership role. Before I begin here today, I want to take a minute to recognize a special group of Americans. I want to recognize the veterans that are here today, these men and women that through their service, selfless service, sacrifice, have allowed us to assemble here today. I want to thank these veterans and recognize them. Would every veteran in the room please stand? Every one of these veterans, every veteran across the nation, and every young man or woman today that wears the uniform of the United States does so because their faith in our country and their determination that we will also be, always be part of the world. They don't want us to pull back. They deserve our appreciation and support to our service. Veterans always have been there for us. There always will be. Thank you, veterans, for all the work that you've done for New Mexico and our country. 
now to tell us a little bit more about, GL, uh, about USGLC's role in the United States and New Mexico, I'm going to bring forward Kerry Campbell, who's going to enlighten us on why we're here today. Kerry? Thank you so much, Secretary Fox. I'm Carrie Campbell, the National Outreach Director for the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. And it's a great honor to be here today in Albuquerque with a great champion for America's global engagement, Senator Tom Udall. And this, our inaugural event in New Mexico, we're so excited to see our coalition growing across this country. Today's discussion comes at a critical time in our country and for those of us who believe in the power of America's global engagement. We all know that there's a lot of news and statistics constantly coming out of Washington, but I want to tell you about three numbers that you seldom hear about. The first number is 20 million. That's the number of individuals that are facing famine in Yemen, South Sudan, Somalia, and Nigeria. What the United Nations is call calling the worst humanitarian emergency since World War II. And if you stop and think about those countries for a minute, this is where you see ISIS, Boko Haram, and Al-Qaeda taking a stronghold. The next number, 65 million. That's the number of refugees and displaced people around the world who are fleeing violence and oppression in their countries, searching for nothing but opportunity and hope. And the last number, 320 million. That's the number of Americans that are vulnerable to the next global health epidemic. Yes, that's every one of us. And we all know that the, global, the next global health epidemic is gonna happen. We don't know its name, and we don't know when it's gonna happen, but history tells us that it will. These challenges, and so many others, like when you turn on the television and see the ever-growing emergencies that are happening in North Korea, or the civil war in Syria, highlight the fact that we live in an ever interconnected, ever complex, and ever challenging world more than any other time in history. And that what happens in Latin America, what happens in Asia, what happens in Africa and the Middle East, indeed what happens in the world has a direct impact to us here at home. At USGLC, we like to think that we play an important role in bringing together a network of voices on the importance of America's global leadership. We are over 500 businesses, humanitarian organizations, and faith-based leaders who come together around the importance of our civilian tools of national power, development, and diplomacy. We have a network across the country from coast to coast, from Arizona to Maine, from Florida to Washington, Texas to North Dakota, and absolutely today right here in New Mexico. Our National Bipartisan Advisory Council, which is led by General Colin Powell, really is a who's who of foreign policy and national security experts, and includes every former Secretary of State, from Henry Kissinger to John Kerry. We have an ever-growing voice of the military community, General Wynyard, who is, we're thrilled to have here today, is a member of our National Security Advisory Council, which is co-chaired by General Anthony Zinni and Admiral James Stavridis, and includes over 180 generals and flag officers. They're accompanied by our ever-growing number of Veterans for Smart Power. That's a group of 30,000 strong veterans that are committed to strengthening our non-military tools of national security. The people in this room today, in fact, are a microcosm of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. Businessmen and women, military veterans of all ranks and ages, and faith leaders and individuals committed to improving the lives of others. We really are what the Washington, Co Washington Post deemed as the coalition of strange bedfellows. And we've all come together in a firm belief of America's global leadership, that in today's interconnected world, Investments in development and diplomacy are not only essential, but are critical to protecting our national security, advancing our economic interests, and project, project, protecting the best of America's values. That leading globally matters locally. Now in Washington, D.C., we advocate for a small but mighty portion of the federal budget known as the International Affairs Budget. 
and around the country, we bring together our unique coalition to give voice to these issues outside of the Beltway, urging members of Congress to support funding for the international affairs budget and thanking them when they do. And here's why we do what we do. At only 1% of our federal budget, the international affairs budget is cost effective and a powerful investment. It's sometimes called the foreign aid budget, but it is so much more than that. It's our diplomats and our embassies around the world, it's support for our key allies, and it's programs that create jobs and open new markets. It's our efforts to tackle global health threats like Ebola and Zika, or respond to humanitarian disasters. And it also helps us address the root causes of terrorism. And the good news is that these programs work. Since 1990, the number of people living in extreme global poverty, defined as living on $1.25 a day or less, has been cut in half. That's over a billion people. Yes, yes, yes. Now, what that means is that that's over a billion people no longer living in extreme global poverty. We're also on the verge of ending diseases like polio and malaria and getting to an AIDS-free generation. Additionally, the fastest growing economies are in developing countries, and American businesses are taking notice and taking advantage of the great opportunities. These days, America's global leadership is critical for our national security and our economic interest, but also for our moral leadership. Since the 1980s, America has been held as that shining city on a hill. And it's clear that the world we live in today and the innumerable humanitarian challenges that we must confront mean that American leadership is more important than ever. And I know that here in New Mexico, you understand that we need more American leadership, not less. So before we get today's discussion started, I wanna say just a couple of thank yous. First, to our event partners that you see here on our screen, who understand the imperative of America's role in the world. Secondly, I'd like to thank the members of our New Mexico Advisory Council, many of whom are in this room today. You truly are the face of USGLC, and we are honored and grateful for your support. And finally, I want to thank each of you for joining us here today and beginning this journey with us to build a better, safer, and more prosperous world. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Many people say that Washington is broken, and yes, sometimes that's true. But at the end of the day, support for the international affairs budget is one of the most bipartisan issues in Congress. We've seen it time and again. We saw it earlier this year when members of Congress stood up to support and protect funding for development and diplomacy or the numerous pieces of bipartisan legislation that Congress has passed to strengthen programs that ensure a strong return on investment for the American taxpayer. Bipartisanship is sometimes hard to come by in Washington, but not when it comes to support for America's global leadership and our civilian to tools of development and diplomacy. But don't just take my word for it. Some say Washington is broken. That our country is just hopelessly divided. But let's be honest, people like to exaggerate. No. Yes. The truth is, there's a lot that still brings us together, both Republicans and Democrats. Democrats and Republicans. A consistent bipartisan effort to help lift people out of poverty around the world. In the last two years, Congress passed significant pieces of legislation that strengthen American global leadership, advance our economic interest, make us more secure, and champion our values. How about the Water for the World Act? It promotes safe, clean drinking water for a billion people around the world. Not bad. Or the Girls Count Act. That's going to ensure that girls around the world are protected. From trafficking and exploitation. Allowing them to get the education they deserve. And that can be game changing. Together, we crafted and passed the Electrify Africa Act. This bill is a step toward fulfilling America's promise to reach 50 million people in Africa and create 30,000 megawatts of generation capacity. Now that's powerful. That's huge. The Global Food Security Act is a big one. We are tackling the root causes of hunger through America's Feed the Future initiative. And already lifting millions of farmers out of poverty 
and providing millions of children nutritional support. We joined together to pass the Foreign Aid Transparency and Accountability Act. That bill ensures an even greater return on investment for the American taxpayer. It's a big win for this small but strategic 1% of the budget. I voted for that. I voted for that. I voted for that. I voted for that too. And so did every one of my colleagues. Every single one. We even got a little wild. No, not that kind of wild. We got the End Wildlife Trafficking Act into the end zone. That's E-N-D, Eliminate, Neutralize, and Disrupt Wildlife Trafficking. That law helps cut off billions of dollars. Billions, billions of dollars to the terrorist organizations from the illegal wildlife trade. And we just voted for the End Modern Slavery Initiative Act. A powerful step towards ending sex and labor enslavement for good. That moves more than 27 million people in 165 countries. Closer to freedom. Yeah, I'd say broken is perhaps a bit overstated. We're getting things done for the American people and for the world. Clean water. Rights for women and girls. Energy infrastructure. Food security. Preventing wildlife trafficking. Thwarting terrorists. Ending modern slavery. It all adds up. It all serves to make our nation safer and stronger. I'm not saying we don't disagree on a few things. But at the end of the day, we're working together for our country. To build a better, safer, and more prosperous world. And that is something we can all be proud of. getting old so I have to use glasses a little bit as I do this. Good morning or good afternoon really is what I should say. I'm Jim Gannon, the CEO and Executive Director of Catholic Charities here in the Archdiocese. And I am also here as a member of the United States Global Leadership Coalition here in New Mexico, Advisory Committee. And I personally believe in the promoting global development and with that, I'm going to say a few words. I wrote them down because I'm not as polished on foreign affairs as some. I got a speech that if I was citing about everything about Catholic charities, I could do off the top of my head. But I have to go to my notes. Here is the CEO of Catholic Charities here in north central New Mexico. I have the opportunity to observe and participate in our nation's dynamic and effective ways of extending foreign assistance. Catholic Charities, our sister Catholic agencies, such as Catholic Relief Services, Caritas International, are proud of the partnerships we have with our government and with other non-government organizations of goodwill around the world who are combating hunger, poverty, and disease, not only here in our nation, but again, around the world. When our government, businesses, and nonprofits work together, we create a better, secure, and vibrant world for the benefit of all. Incredible things happen when we make strategic investments in such programs that are critical to the humanitarian needs of the world. When we offer life-saving medical treatments, response to disease disasters, educate children, and ensure access to clean, safe water. We are extending the hand of friendship, demonstrating America's leadership is built on principles and creating relationships that are win-win. We should do this because it is the American way and it's just good old common sense. And I know that uh, Jason here has a few more words and we'll talk about how uh, our community is engaged through commerce and business in foreign affairs. Jason. Uh, thank you for those great words, Jim. I'm Jason Espinoza. I'm president and CEO with the New Mexico Association of Commerce and Industry. And like Jim, I am a proud member of USGLC's New Mexico Advisory Committee. And I'm here this morning on behalf of the many large and small businesses in our state who know that our local economy is linked to the economic currents of the world. 95% of the world's consumers live outside of our borders and today's fastest growing markets are in the developing world. It can't be overstated that these are the markets of today and of tomorrow. 
In order to advance America's interests in these markets, we rely on the strategic investments in diplomacy and economic development to do what private business cannot, help fight corruption, promote rule of law, and open markets for America's goods and services. At ECI, we know that one in five American jobs are tied to international trade, and that one-third of all manufacturing jobs in the U.S. are directly tied to our exports. And that's why we understand that the critical programs funded by the international affairs budget help keep America competitive in the global marketplace, which is key to our economic prosperity here at home. I know that our guest speakers today share this understanding. Uh, this afternoon's tremendous panel will include a member of the USGLC's National Security Advisory Council, General Jean Renouart, who has witnessed the importance of America's development and diplomacy's efforts firsthand. The general most recently served as the commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command and the U.S. Northern Command, and previously served as the Director of Strategic Plans and Policy on the Joint Staff and as the Senior Military Assistant to the Secretary of Defense. As the Director of Operations for U.S. Central Command, he oversaw the planning and execution of all combat and humanitarian assistance operations in Iraq and Afghanistan from 2001 to 2003. We are fortunate to hear the General's insights today. Additionally, we have Carrie hessler Radlett, who is the President and CEO of Project Concern International, a global development organization that works overseas to improve global health and to end hunger. For the past four years, Kerry served as Director of the Peace Corps, a government agency I'm sure most of the audience today are quite familiar with. In her role as Director, she oversaw America's International Volunteer Service organization in over 65 countries and led reforms to modernize and strengthen the agency to meet today's unique challenges and opportunities. We will also welcome back USGLC's Kerry Campbell to the stage, who will moderate today's discussion. We also look forward, so we look forward to hearing from the panel soon, but first it is my pleasure to introduce Senator Tom Udall, a strong leader and advocate of America's development and diplomacy programs. As a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and Senate Appropriations Committee, Senator Udall is uniquely positioned to understand the value of America's global engagement. And he has been an influential voice on U.S. foreign policy. He has long supported diplomacy. He has long, he has long supported diplomacy and global engagement to bolster our national security and create jobs in New Mexico, including expanding border commerce, increasing tourism, and business opportunities here in New Mexico. Senator Udall, we greatly appreciate your leadership and for joining us here today. The state is well served by your outstanding public service and strong support for the international affairs budget. Ladies and gentlemen, please join, in me, join me in welcoming our very special guest to the stage, Senator Tom Udall. James, I told him I'm joining him in the Glasses Caucus. But uh, thank you, Jason, for those, those uh, very nice words. And Secretary Fox, always, uh, always exciting to see you and to see uh, uh, the good work you're doing for our veterans. Very much appreciate that. And Carrie, thank you for that very, uh, that very thoughtful, very, very thoughtful uh, address you did there. You, cut, you stole a few of my topics, but I'm, I'm going to plow through them anyway. But let, let me just tell you what a pleasure it is to be here today. This coalition, I believe, is truly impressive. It's, to, it's a testament to the fact that we all have a stake in diplomacy, global development, and we have a stake as citizens, as charitable and religious groups, and as businesses. And so many of you are here today uh, expressing that support. You know, there's an old adage uh, I, I had thought it went to a, a California congressman, uh, and I told my staff to look it up. Politics stops at the water's edge, uh, but they tell me it goes, that goes all the way back to Daniel Webster in 1814. 
Uh, the United States is stronger when we keep partisan politics out of diplomacy and international affairs. And that's really what this coalition stands for. And you saw uh, that my colleagues uh, in the video that Kerry introduced there, many of them that we, we all work together on these international issues. The launch of the New Mexico Advisory Committee, I believe, is an exciting opportunity for New Mexicans to engage with the world. As a border state, New Mexico knows very well the importance of good relations with other countries. We are also home to many veterans, and I'm glad that our organizers reached out to bring so many here today. And thank you, Secretary Fox, for having them all stand. I mean, this is a really impressive gathering of veterans. And veterans truly know why it's important that we're organized around the issues we are here today. And so thank you for being here, and thank you very much for your service. Let's, I won't ask them to stand again, but let's give them a round of applause. Um, when, it, when it comes to foreign policy and diplomacy, none of us has more at stake than, a, than the men and women who serve on the front lines, including those in the Foreign Service. Many, many of you have seen firsthand the benefits of U.S. leadership abroad. Thank you for continuing to care about America's role in the world around us. When we started planning this event months ago, we didn't know that the whole world would be watching the dynamic role that diplomacy and military play in national security. The escalating rhetoric between the United States and North Korea is a reminder that nuclear proliferation threatens all of us. The world depends on steady U.S. leadership. Sober and calm diplomacy de-escalates tensions. It is how we prevent deadly conflicts. Cool heads must lead in this situation. And we must remember this as Congress debates the proposal to make deep cuts in the budgets for international development and the State Department budget. I can't say it clearly enough. These proposed cuts are a dangerous idea. I, I will talk more about that in a moment, but first I wanted to talk about the positive impact these programs have made. And you saw some of it in Kerry's slides, but I think it can always be uh, emphasized here. Smartly targeted international aid helps developing countries improve health care, education, and their economies. It also pays big dividends to the United States of America. It leads to more stable political systems. It reduces violence. And it opens up the opportunity for governments to establish legal systems based on the rule of law. Business and job opportunities grow and a more stable world means our own nation's security is protected. The world recognizes our leadership. From my seat on the Foreign Relations Committee, I've seen the good that our international aid has done. For example, from the beginning of his term, his first term, President George W. Bush understood the link between combating AIDS in Africa and U.S. national security interests. AIDS was a humanitarian crisis that was threatening millions of lives. It was also threatening the political stability of African nations. And that instability threatened our security interests. So in 2003, President Bush and a bipartisan group in Congress created the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or now what is known uh, by everyone in the community is PEPFAR, and I think you'll hear a lot about PEPFAR when we get up here and start our panel discussion. I hope some of you will tell us stories when you get to the, the question section and send in your cards. Um, so in 2003, President Bush took this action. Billions were allocated to fight AIDS in focused countries in Africa and other nations. The United States helped build health care capacity to treat AIDS from the ground up. At that time, I had the opportunity to visit Africa with the head of the CDC, Tom Frieden, and the top Democrat who was then the chairman of the Foreign AIDS Appropriations Committee, and to take a look firsthand at the kinds of results that 
you, you could see from PEPFAR. That program has saved, and I think you, you, many of you have seen the trailer here, but it bears repeating. Program has saved a million and a half, 11 million and a half people's lives and helped nearly two million pregnant women living with HIV give birth to HIV-free babies. The program also helps keep these mothers healthy so that they can raise and care for their children. The United States has been a world leader fighting AIDS because of this PEPFAR program. And, and now let's, I'm going to talk a little bit about today because I, I think I'm jumping forward here 13 years. The story is very different. President Trump wants to cut $300 million for PEPFAR's budget. That is part of a proposed 31% cut to the State Department and the U.S. Agency for International De Development. And I can't tell you how strongly I oppose those cuts and or I am going to make sure that they don't happen. But thankfully, <laughs> thank you. Thankfully, the politics of slashing the State Department's budget has bipartisan pushback. Senator Bob Corker, my chairman there on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, said the pre president's proposal, and I, I'm going to quote his words now, he said, quote, goes into the wastebasket as soon as it gets here. You see, so... And, and when, when we had a ver variety of hearings looking at these programs, other Republicans and Democrats on the committee have expressed displeasure with these cuts. And many of us in person, Secretary uh, Tillerson had us up to the State Department for a breakfast, the entire Foreign Relations Committee, and as we went around the table, that was the discussion that we had with him. We really worried about what was going on in terms of cutting these programs. Now, also, uh, Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Senator Lindsey Graham, and other key Republican foreign policy figures also oppose these cuts. Unfortunately, the House funding bill, which passed the House Appropriations Committee, I don't believe it's hit the House floor yet, makes a huge cut in the State Department's budget, 14 percent. The Senate will take up this funding in September, so the debate is occurring right now when we return after this break. Uh, to Washington after Labor Day. I don't think the President appreciates the value of diplomacy and foreign assistance to U.S. interests. Otherwise, he would not have proposed such irresponsible cuts. And I hope he will read the 2013 testimony from General James Mattis who said, and I, I think said it very bluntly and very well, if you don't fund the State Department fully, then I need to buy more ammunition. So I think it's a cost-benefit ratio, he said. The more we put into the State Department's diplomacy, hopefully the less we have to put into a military budget as we deal with the outcome of apparent American withdrawal from the international scene. That's General Mattis, who's now, as you all know, our Secretary of Defense. General Mattis is known for his blunt style, and I think he made his point in the way only a Marine could. So I'm also working hard on both the Foreign Relations Committee and the Appropriations Committee to support a responsible budget that protects and promotes American interests around the globe. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the implications for New Mexico, because many of you in the audience, and, and there are so many I, that I talked to earlier, uh, know the implications of what these kinds of cuts uh, can, uh, the impact that they can have here in New Mexico. We feel direct and real implications of U.S. political and economic relations with other countries. Mane New Me Mexico, Mexico is a neighbor. We share strong cultural, historical, family, and economic connections with our friend of the South. Rhetoric about building a wall has strained relations between our countries, and talk of threatening to tear up NAFTA threatens economic development here in New Mexico. So I've spent a good deal of time along the border visiting with community leaders in Columbus and Santa Teresa, for example. New Mexico has seen big growth in international trade. 
In 2013, our state exported $2.7 billion around the world, including $800 million to Mexico. Last year, New Mexico sold $3.6 billion worth of goods globally and $1.6 billion down south. That's a 100% increase in trade with Mexico in over three years. And New Mexico's exports supported over 15,000 jobs in nearly 12,000 small and medium-sized businesses last year. I worked hard for years to secure federal funds for a $90 million expansion of the Columbus Port of Entry, a smart border, not a wall that allows goods and people to move efficiently, creates jobs in New Mexico, and grows economic opportunities in both countries. Eroding relationships with our neighbors and attacking international norms is not a sustainable economic strategy for New Mexico or the United States. So in, so, thank you. Thank you. In, 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 in conclusion, the United States has led global diplomatic trade and humanitarian efforts throughout the world since World War II. Our efforts have seen the largest economic growth in history and led to the most peaceful period in human history. The Global Leadership Coalition understands the importance of U.S. global influence. I am proud to partner with you to ensure that the United States continues to lead the world. Thank you again for inviting me to the beginning of what I know will be a great project, and I am looking forward to our panel discussion and questions. And I just want to say, just stay engaged, keep involved, and keep pushing, because that's what allows me and the many others that you saw in the video and many, many other members of Congress to do the right thing and move and have America continue to be a leader in the world. Thank you very much. And, uh, Kerry, are you coming up and having our folks come here? Thank you. Thank you. I'd first like to say thank you very much. I think he just uh, made it perfectly clear why we call him a champion in Washington on global engagement and global leadership. And so again, thank you all to all of you for sending such a great senator to Washington uh, to, to support America's global engagement. Thank you. Thank you. So as you know, our conversation today is about America's role in the world and how it impacts here in New Mexico. I want to organize the discussion today in three different topics, one from a national security perspective, the other from an economic interest perspective, and the other from an American values, humanitarian values perspective. But I don't want it to be just us up here talking. We want to make sure that you all are engaged in this conversation as well. So if you look on your tables, you have note cards with pencils. Please feel free as the conversation continues and questions come up or comments come up, Write them down, and there's USGLC staff that will come around and pick them up, and we will want to include your ideas, your questions, and your thoughts as part of our dialogue today. So I want to kick off this conversation starting with you, General. Um, first of all, thank you for being part of our National Security Advisory Council and a critical member at that. So on the same day that news reports highlighted drastic cuts to the State Department and USAID that Senator Udall referred to, you, along with 120 other retired three- and four-star generals, signed a letter to Congress really urging them not to engage in these cuts. And so I'd like to hear why you decided to sign that letter and what you think the impact would be if these cuts were to happen. Well, thanks for the question. And, uh, it's a very personal uh, answer for me. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, our youngest son is a University of New Mexico graduate. And, uh, and can, can, yeah. <laughs> can, every, can everybody hear the general? Can you hear him? Oh, okay, yeah. 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 yeah, I think, I think it fell off on you, general, there. There it is. I got it. I 
Start from the top, okay, so they can all hear that. That was a really yeah, important yeah, piece of a, information. That was an important piece of information. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the answer to the question is very personal for, for both me and for my wife. First, uh, very proudly, our son is a University of New Mexico graduate and a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and so um, the, our, our tie both to the state and to the importance of international aid development is, is important in our family. Uh, the second anecdote I'd mention is that our oldest son is a four combat tour veteran of Afghanistan and Iraq in our Air Force's combat search and rescue. And he now works for the State Department as a special agent with a diplomatic security service. Uh, and he's in Egypt now. So uh, again, we, we have a pretty selfish reason for wanting to see continued support for uh, foreign aid and development. Uh, from a security perspective, however, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier, I was the director of operations at U.S. Central Command when 9-11 occurred. And, and our role at the time was to plan and conduct combat operations, but also to plan and conduct humanitarian assistance operations simultaneously in, an, in a country where we have had no relations and essentially we had abandoned for, you know, arguably 15 years or so. And uh, what I understood very clearly was that if you don't have a very close relationship as a military planner with our State Department and really the many other aid agencies that are involved around the world, it's very difficult to conduct a well thought out campaign. And as you might recall in Afghanistan, over 50% of the country was fed by aid organizations primarily supported out of the United States. So, I would much prefer to see we continue to invest in those kinds of activities because it makes the job of the military and the security of the nation actually easier. One last comment, and then I'll, I'll go back to you here, Kerry. Uh, when, when the Russians left Afghanistan in the late 80s and the Cold War ended and we had this great peace dividend that we were going to take advantage of, the State Department suffered um, significantly in that regard. And for those of you that have been involved in USAID, you know how that budget plummeted and the number of USAID staff around the world, and I'm, my numbers probably aren't right, but went from something like 15 or 16,000 to about 1,500. So when I was and my team were planning operations in Afghanistan, we needed the muscle of USAID to help us, and there was nobody home. And it wasn't because there wasn't desire, it was because we had underfunded that element of the State Department's budget and you had to completely rebuild that. Think of what might have happened when the Russians left Afghanistan, had the US and other nations said, we're gonna infuse that region with two, a couple billion dollars worth of aid to grow education, to grow economic development, to grow rule of law. We might not have had to spend the billions and billions and billions of dollars after 9-11. So I think it's really, really important and critical to the security of our nation and so it was very easy for me to sign that letter. It, it was in many ways a no-brainer because I've watched my son go into combat and I'd just as soon avoid that if possible. There's times when we have to be the leader militarily, but there's lots of other tools that we need to take advantage of first. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and speaking about that funding and that you encourage that funding, and Senator, you sit on the Appropriations Committee. So I want to first take a minute to thank you and your colleagues for, for the funding that you just allocated for the FY18 International Affairs Budget, which is drastically more money than the administration had proposed. And I recognize that we have a long way to go until we get to the final spending bill. So I want to hear from you, and I know you touched on it a little bit in your remarks, but really hear from you about what we all can do from USGLC's perspective, from everyone in this room's perspective, of how we can work to ensure protection of funding for that budget. Yeah. Well, I, I think, first of all, this organization and, and what this organization uh, stands for uh, has moved us a long ways forward. When you have Democrats and Republicans com coming together, you have business, you have uh, 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 the faith community, everyone pulling together and saying, this is important to us, then we're able to stand in Washington uh, and say, as the general did, these dollars are important, they do important things, and, and 
you can make the argument, I think, a very good argument. You, you can make the argument overseas and talk about all the good that's done there, but the good flows back to us, General, and both carries here. It, it flows <laughs> back to us, uh, and, and that's tremendously important. And so I, I would just, as, as I close my speech there, I talked about staying engaged, staying involved. The congressional delegation always uh, needs to hear from you. But the things that you care about, the values that you care about in your community, the organizations you get involved with, that really makes a difference, I believe, to kind of move the world forward. Uh, and so I'll stop there. Well, th th well thank you. And, and we look forward to, to weighing in with your office and your colleague's office to move that, continue to move that ball forward. And as you talk about how it comes back to us, the flow comes back to us, I think that that's not only true in national security, as we've talked about, but also from an economic development perspective. And just a couple of things I want to mention, that 95% of the world's consumers are outside of our borders, and seven of the 10 fastest growing markets are in developing countries. And that uh, here in New Mexico, as you alluded to, the, the numbers of exports that we're doing, that you're doing globally, are just astronomical and a, make a huge impact to this, to this uh, economy here in New Mexico. So, Carrie, I want to turn to you and talk to you a little bit about foreign assistance and coupled with your work with other NGOs, like pro your work with Project Concern International and the other NGOs that are doing work. Uh, and those are NGOs that are in the room today that are doing the work and how they lay the groundwork for an enabling environment for economic prosperity and private sector investment in developing countries. And so I want you to share with us a little bit about how reducing poverty and hunger around the world helps us to build a more prosperous and stable society that allow us for better trade, particularly for those New Mexico businesses that are in the room. Sure. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to say how impressed I am that 250 of you came out on a August Monday at noon to see this. This shows that you're energized. Absolutely. I'm really incredibly Absolutely. impressed. Way to go to Mexico. You are. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is an issue that's important. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about the good news. You talked about a little bit in your introduction, but I, I want to make sure everyone understands that there has been more progress in the past 25 years in lifting people out of poverty than in the past 500 years combined. Yep. There's been more socioeconomic progress in the past 20 years than has ever been seen any time in the course of human history. You heard some of the statistics. There are now about 19 million people with HIV AIDS who are on life-saving drugs, people who would definitely be dead if they didn't have those drugs that are supported through our PEPFAR program. President's emergency plan for AIDS relief. Infant mortality rates around the world have been cut in half. Mm. The average lifespan of people around the world has increased 10 years over the last 20 years. And that is at a time when we still had HIV AIDS to compromise those, those life expectancy gains. There has been phenomenal progress. So we have seen that it works. Congress wants to fund things that work. And, and our work in development and diplomacy works, and it's proven time and again. Um, also, we do a lot of research, and research has shown that those countries that respect rule of law and respect the rights of the citizens are much more likely to be safer, to be growing economically at a faster rate, and to um, be better global partners. And so it makes sense for all the reasons that we've described to invest in, in um, helping our partner nations to become economically sustainable. You heard from Jason earlier about all of the trade that uh, New Mexico does across the border. I mean, trade comprises about 20% of your, your revenues here. And so trade, particularly with Mexico, is important. Peace Corps, now I, I spent a long time talking about Peace Corps, but Peace Corps is in two of your top three, three trading partners. We're in Mexico, your leading trading partner, and in China. Um, so our country is investing heavily in those countries to make them more economically developed so that they can, in turn, buy products from New Mexico. So one of the last visits that I made just um, prior to stepping down as Peace Corps director was to Mexico. 
And in Mexico, our program is very specialized. It focuses on community economic development, and we work in close partnership with some of the U.S. government partners or U.S. nonprofit organizations like mine, Project Concern International, and there are many organizations that work with USAID and with the Peace Corps in terms of building economic growth in the countries where we serve. But my last trip was to Mexico, and our program focuses particularly on vocational education because Mexico has done a phenomenal job of increasing access to education. But what they find is that as they have grown economically, the need for um, technical skills has really increased. And the schools are not preparing youth for the jobs that the businesses need in order for them to grow. And students are graduating from high school now with skills that are not marketable. So it's a real dilemma for them. And so we were asked, um, both the USAID and the Peace Corps were asked to support vocational education. And so I visited a vocational, the largest vocational education program that is the, in Mexico, and Peace Corps volunteers are working there, doing a whole range of things. They're helping to support curriculum development. They're introducing new um, teaching methodologies. They're trying to introduce better monitoring and evaluation and other testing mechanisms to help evaluate student performance creating um, more conducive learning environments, and especially really making the connection between the skills that are taught in vocational schools and that which is needed in the workforce. And um, the program that we developed is um, expected to impact 100,000 Mexican students over the next five years. And we're working in close partnership with the Ministry of Education, so if it's scaled up, it's a program approach that is going to literally reach millions and millions of people. Now, I spoke to the president of that university, spent the whole afternoon with him, and he really was so profoundly grateful for the um, services of our volunteers. And he said, look, we get a lot of technical assistance. We're a big university. We have relationships with many universities around the world. But I want to tell you that Peace Corps is very different. And Peace Corps is unique, really, in, ter in the world. Peace Corps is, is one of our greatest um, exports, and there are very few, very few countries that have programs like Peace Corps. I would like to say that. Um, he said, your volunteers, because they live among our people, they learn the language, understand our culture, and understand from a profoundly personal level both the opportunities for development, but also the barriers to development. And they also can have, they have the credibility because of their engagement in the community, even apart from their job, um, of being able to introduce new methodologies that are um, accepted by our community. And because of that, your volunteers also are so focused on helping students to be successful, they go the extra mile to get to know the students, to help them understand their own potential, and to dream big dreams well beyond um, what they would have ever dreamt had they not had this exposure, um, both in vocational education of a high level, but also understanding that there is a world out there beyond the boundaries of their village. He said it has made such an enormous difference in the performance of our students. And what this does for our country, and this is him speaking to me, he said, what this does is it allows our students to prosper. They can, they're earning more money, so then they can buy American products. And it really, through our economic ties, has strengthened the relationship between our two countries. And I just thought that was such, you know, this is from the president of a vocational technical school. He's not a diplomat. He's not someone who normally speaks on these terms, but he is seeing it from the ground in the, in the lives of his students. And um, I just thought that was a good example to share. Absolutely. And Senator Yudal, here you have a pretty good example from a recent trip you took earlier this year to both Cuba and Colombia with the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Thad Cochran. So uh, particularly with Colombia, because they've transferred themselves from a cartel-ridden drug trafficking state to really a good partner for American businesses. So I wonder if you have any stories to share from that trip and, and the impact that it's making. You, you bet. You bet. Um, first of all, the Peace Corps was down there uh, and has been down there for a long time. And my good friend in the House of Representatives, Sam Farr, yeah. served there. And one of, the, one of the things that happens, it doesn't happen very often, but there, there are members of Congress that serve in the Peace Corps. 
they come back as advocates for the country they yeah. served in. And, and I think the same thing's true, Kerry, of these uh, members of the Peace Corps that, that serve over in a country. They come back to the United States and they share that with all of us. Yeah. And they share that throughout their lives. And it, and it really, really uh, makes a difference. And so let me get back to, to Kerry's question here. On this, this uh, trip to Colombia, um, we were trying to look at, at once again, one, one of the things I, I got to tell you from the beginning is when we spend funds, we always want to spend funds on things that work. And when we're in the Appropriations Committee and working in appropriations, we're always trying to make sure that our American dollars are spent more efficiently and in a better way. And so sometimes you, you just don't hear that. You think we're always just throwing money at things, but the, the reality is we are a guardian of the purse there on the Appropriations Committee. And, and what I was impressed by in, in Colombia is here uh, you had a program over, over the course of many years where you had a completely divided country. Uh, you had major areas, which, by the way, there were a number of, of uh, uh, national parks in these areas at the FARC control that nobody could visit because they, they were too dangerous. And, and the FARC really separated uh, the country in the areas they controlled. There was guerrilla warfare, and it went on for decades and decades. And the United States weighed in with diplomatic aid, with military aid, uh, some of it controversial. I, I remember in the Congress several times hearing some of the arguments on some of the things we were doing. But the reality is, at the end of the day, Kerry, is that we moved them to a point uh, where they were willing to negotiate and to get, a, get in a settlement. I, I, the, the magnanimity and the forgiveness that I saw in that country down there, what they had us meet with, we were around a table about the size of this table, the tables you're sitting with, sitting at. And, and here they pulled in people from the FARC. And, and many of them had started fighting as youngsters, as guerrilla fighters, as youngsters. And they kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And at some point, they realized with this proposal, you know, we've had enough fighting. Let's step outside of that and search for peace, search for a way together. And, and the stories of these individuals, you would have a, 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 a young girl that started fighting at 17 years of age, and here she was 27 years old, uh, and she hadn't known anything uh, but fighting uh, for, for a good half of her life, for half of her adult life. And she talked about how, you know, it's got to finish. We want to work with each other. This was in a reintegration process. And what they were willing to do in this reintegration is actually forgive all of the things of the past and then move to a new situation in the future. Now, it's, a, it's, it's still an, it's a work in progress, but I was tremendously impressed as we moved along over the years, as you monitor uh, what was happening there in Colombia, uh, moving in a dramatic direction towards peace and towards a better democracy. And, and they, it ends up, too, that we're, we're a, uh, uh, obviously a pretty good trading partner with them. We work with them, and, and it goes both ways. And, and we're going to be better because of the peaceful situation that's evolving there. So what I find so interesting is because of the work that we've done there, they have now become the third largest export market in Latin America. So you right. really do get to see an opportunity of these programs at work and the positive effect, Carrie, that you were talking about, that it's not all doom and gloom, that we're making such great progress. So, which makes me want to turn to the humanitarian side of, of the conversation. So, um, General Renoir, I want to bring you into this back into the conversation a little bit and ask you about these investments. And so you've traveled around the world and you've seen the work that we are doing in investing in, in development and diplomacy. And we talk all the time about how it's the right thing to do, not only the right thing to do, but also the smart thing to do. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about why you think it's the smart thing to do and the impact globally from a, from a general perspective that we're having. Well, uh, a couple points that I'd make, Carrie, and, and I think it's important for everyone to understand that um, it, when you have a Peace Corps volunteer, for example, in a country, they not only give of themselves while they're there, but they build a relationship that will last 
maybe for generations. Um, I was telling a story earlier tonight where our younger son who had been in Senegal um, and, and in the very Muslim part of the country, uh, we, were, we were up in the Summit County getting ready to do some skiing and a, two young men were working in a, in a store there and he recognized that they were from Senegal and he went over and spoke to them in their native Pular language and, and their eyes got really big and they immediately assumed Peace Corps but they made the point that, that that organization had created opportunities for them for education and then for travel, and now they're here in the United States trying to grow opportunities. So this, it's not just the U.S. spending money to, to give to other countries. It's building relationships, and I'll give you a couple really important examples of that. You might recall the tsunami that occurred in Indonesia and Thailand uh, in, in South Central Asia in Christmas of 2005. Um, and the world focused, you know, millions and millions of dollars in, in aid to, to that region. The traditional diplomatic process and government process is a little cumbersome at times, but because three or four of the senior military in that region had gone to the Army War College or the Naval War College or to some a academic institution with young officers who now were the chief of defense staff of that nation, they could pick up the phone and bypass the bureaucracy to get aid in to those areas, especially in northern Indone Indonesia. You might recall that the, this was also the center of this, uh, the epicenter of this earthquake was in the Aceh province of northern Indonesia. Well, that was the separatist process or uh, provinces of Indonesia and those individuals were fighting bloody battles with government forces to, to secede, if you will, uh, from the country. The influx of foreign aid and investment and assistance under many flags, certainly great marines and, and sailors were in there very early, but it, it actually convinced the leaders of the rebels that their path was not the right path for them. They saw this outflow of, of warmth and compassion from the world, and they began to realize that maybe they shouldn't be fighting against the government, maybe we should begin to talk about how do we reunite. So not unlike what we've seen in Colombia with the FARC, you saw a, a, a very violent resistance movement essentially dissolve in the, in the bath of humanitarian aid and assistance uh, ac across a, a ravaged country. Last piece I'd say is that when the uh, earthquake hit in, um, uh, in Haiti a few years ago, 2009, I, I want to say, uh, the very first people on the ground were U.S. military. And they weren't there to command or control. They were there to bring humanitarian assistance and aid immediately to those people on the ground. Uh, so the, the ability of, of the Department of Defense, Department of State, and the aid, aid agencies who are present, present around the world to interact in a crisis, to, to focus their, what they do best on a region, brings incredible results. To, to step away from that U.S. leadership globally uh, causes us to have to pay that back in billions of dollars and, sadly, uh, treasure of our young men and women. We just... We just can't afford to keep doing that. Yeah, absolutely. So now um, I want to turn to a few of the audience questions and, and get your thoughts and, and questions involved in this conversation. So this comes from Sean. And Senator Udall, I'm going to address this to you first. It says, New Mexico is a leading exporter of high-tech products and computers with more than 1,400 New Mexico companies exporting goods to overseas markets in 2016. How can development agencies like Export-Import Bank, the Overseas Private Investment Corps, and U.S. Trade and Development Agencies, a couple of agencies that we haven't yet talked about that's funded within the international affairs budget, how can these agencies help our companies compete overseas against aggressive companies and competitors like China? Yeah, and it, it, um, Carrie, it isn't only China. It, many of the countries in the world weigh in much more heavily than the mm -hmm. United States does in terms of helping their companies. And then, as, as you know, uh, China's a good example of all these state-owned companies which have 
uh, massive support from the government. And so um, those three agencies that were mentioned, led by the uh, Export-Import Bank, play a tremendous role. I mean, I, I, when I first got into Congress, I didn't realize what the role was at all. But as I started circulating in the business community and meeting uh, small business people here in avionics or whatever area it was, the thing that you would see happen uh, is that they, they were struggling, but with a little bit of extra help and a little bit of extra guidance from the Export-Import Bank or one of the other agencies, they were able to get over the hump and start making a real difference internationally. And so, so um, we're having a big kind of ideological battle now in the Congress over these. It really helps if your coalition stands up and says, these organizations make a difference. And, and I really believe that. And, I, and you see it here in New Mexico. You see it in other states. Uh, the, one of the big leaders on Export-Import Bank in the Senate is Heidi Heitkamp from North Dakota. And you, you wonder, well, what, what would the Export-Import Bank do in North Dakota? Well, she feels it's important to her state and her people and makes a real difference. And so I, I think that uh, uh, helps all of us. And, and once again, as an interconnected world, I think it's, it's very, very important that we uh, make sure those programs work effectively, but at the same time uh, that we fund them and, and we evaluate them over time and see that they're doing a good job. Absolutely. Can yes, I make another, no. another turn on that issue? Absolutely. And that is the important role that our country plays in nurturing and educating the leaders of other countries who become presidents right. or right. members of parliament or ministers in those countries. Our tax dollars support programs funded by USAID, Peace Corps, others that are focused on education and by targeting youth. Youth are really the um, beneficiaries of a lot of programs that are supported by our tax dollars. And uh, my own organization, PCI, does a lot of work with youth. And I know from P my time at Peace Corps that by targeting youth in the 70s and 80s, these people are now growing up and they are the leaders of their country. But these are people, because they have been educated on either on exchange programs um, funded by State Department, um, they had a Peace Corps volunteer who worked in their community, they had, uh, um, they were, they benefited from education programs that were supported by organizations like ours. Um, they have very positive perceptions of the United States. They share our values, they, um, they want to trade with us, and they want to engage with us on a broader scale. Right now, right now in Africa alone, there are 12 presidents who say they got their start from a Peace Corps volunteer. If you looked at the number who had been on Fulbright programs and other programs, it's probably more like 20. These are people who are, de who are developing you know, policies, trade policies, economic policies, and, and they look to us favorably because of the relationship mm -hmm. that was developed when they were young people supported by our programs. It just shows you the virtuous circle that, that investing in development can have in terms of our own political engagement with those countries. It can have dramatic effects even on our businesses as well. You know, you know, Carrie, the, the other thing you remind me of, and, and it isn't just about these government programs. What the government programs do right. is engender yeah. a good feeling in our people about doing additional things. Absolutely. And, and the other day, the other day uh, I was at a, a, a meeting where a nonprofit had pulled together Palestinian and Israeli yes. young people who lived in villages on both sides of the border where there was just constant conflict and they felt that there was, the, there, each of them felt that the other side was a true enemy. Mm -hmm. And this nonprofit over the last, I think, seven or eight years has brought 270 of the, they have a camp, they, they, mm -hmm. uh, they work through a mediation and dialogue process. Uh, they end up at the end of the camp, most of them becoming very good friends for the, I think yeah. for the rest of their lives. And so you're engendering not only by these programs and what the government's doing, you're engendering in our people ideas for how to yes. push uh, right. some kind of, uh, 
uh, peaceful resolution. And you never know when someone out of a program like that becomes the head uh, of, of a state yeah. and they've mm -hmm. had that experience and, the, and they have all those people to rely on to move forward in a peaceful yeah. way. So yeah. it, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to see and to see how we, our programs kind of plant the seeds of, of that activity. Yeah. Yeah. Could, could I just yeah. add one more anecdote to that? Because this is a great discussion. This is also not just government business. And, and we have leaders from businesses from New Mexico here and certainly across the country. And I, I think sometimes we assume that, and while we would love to have the senator double the State Department's <laughs> budget focused on these things, um, this is also global responsibility on the part of our U.S. businesses. And so right. there is fertile ground for those businesses to be engaged in international development, some through uh, the existing organizations, some through new that are, that are finding ways to make contacts in countries that are still developing. And, and that's actually good business for them because it creates those same relationships over time with growing leaders in the nation. There's a, a, there are a number of books about Afghanistan, and I won't go into the author because he was a little discredited, but one of the comments <laughs> was the importance of educating women. And when you think about this, moms kind of really don't want their kids to go fight and die. I have a mom who kind of lived that during a couple conflicts. So she reminds me often that finding ways not to put your child in harm's way is kind of important. Well, the same is true globally. Right. Um, educated women who become mothers don't want their babies to go off and die. So that's a sound investment, and it doesn't have to be just the U.S. government, but it can be a coalition of, of partners who are out there doing that work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and I think to that point, you know, we've sort of revised the way that we do development and diplomacy since World War II, with bringing in American businesses and doing public-private partnerships. And I was talking to someone earlier today that the government alone can't do it, and charities alone can't do it, and businesses alone can't do it. But as a partnership, as we're all coming together, coming up with smart, innovative ways to, to deal with the global challenges that we face are the way that we're moving forward and really making the difference in the world. So this conversation, or this question comes from Mary, and, and I'm gonna, General and, and Carrie, direct it a little bit to you, but Senator Udall, please feel free to weigh in, of course. Um, so New Mexico is home to some of the largest military bases in, in the country. And given that we have so many complex challenges in America today, our armed services are actively promoting U.S. national, national interests around the globe. How does our military coordinate with our civilian tools of national security, including development and diplomacy, to advance American interests and tackle our development challenges? And how does the military work with our NGOs and other agencies on the ground to, to deal with some of these issues? Carrie, great question for a general from the Air Force. We have three Air Force bases, so go ahead. We're very proud of them. We're very I think Mary knew what she was talking about when she asked that question. Why, Senator? I'm surprised that you would say that. No, in fact, uh, we spent some wonderful time here in New Mexico at a couple of those Air Force bases. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, it, I hate to say 9-11 changed the world because it sounds cliche. But in, in this particular issue, it really did change the world of interaction between aid organizations and the Department of Defense. There was a, a period as we were beginning to consider what, what was required in Afghanistan where we would, first of all, you had uh, uh, organizations within the Department of State who many did not have a security clearance and so you couldn't even bring them into the planning process. Many of the, of the aid organizations uh, in countries around that region were very skeptical of interacting with the U.S. military for fear that it would put their volunteers at risk. And so we had to really build a coalition. Part of my role was to build an international coalition amongst the 72 nations, but we really built, maybe more importantly, about a 17 or 18 nation coalition among the aid agencies who were in Afghanistan. And we had to create fairly creative methods for, for collaboration because you have to protect the, the ability for those organizations to be out in the field and be in each of the villages and build those relationships. But they also have to have security. They have to, especially if 
if you're simultaneously conducting uh, combat operations and humanitarian assistance operations. Interestingly, the Air Force doctrine for conducting an air campaign is you make the enemy pay and every road, every bridge, every TV tower, every telephone building, whatever, has to go away so they can't communicate. Well, guess who has to use all that to feed people and to move around the country? And so we actually had some internal clashes uh, amongst the planners to say, no, actually you can't go blow up bridges and roads because CARE needs to get, you know, use the ring road in Afghanistan to get food and medicine around. So, so this is a, it's a real uh, dilemma that has, has evolved substantially now since 9-11, uh, 2001. And we now see a very active interaction between primarily the Department of State as the lead integrator amongst the aid agencies and the Department of Defense in a planning process. We exercise, if you will, together to plan through a variety of humanitarian contingencies. And, and the, the good news that the military brings is we have size and we have mobility and we have communication. And, and actually, uh, since we began with the so-called pr provisional reconstruction teams in Afghanistan, we've become pretty good at doing economic development and rule of law and agriculture and, and education. So I, I think we've sort of broken through some of those institutional prejudices that existed to now realize that we really have to collaborate mm -hmm. in all these areas. And you look at Indonesia and Haiti and, and Pakistan after their earthquake, uh, and, and certainly many more that, that have or will occur. The Ebola outbreak in Africa, I mean, a mm -hmm. substantial interaction between DOD and state and aid agencies. Uh, I, I think we've, we've, we have solved it, but we've begun to figure out that we have to work more closely together. Right. Yeah. Right. Do you want me to say something? Uh, sure. I, I would like to um, just briefly mention the importance of the private sector working with the nonprofit right. sector. I mean, that's something that's done here in New Mexico, I'm sure. And um, the work that we do in development, PCI, and most of the large organizations that do uh, development work partner extensively with for-profit organizations because it makes sense. They're interested in emerging markets. They want to get to know the countries where they hope to sell their products. They have a vested interest, but they also know that it, it's good misses from a corporate social responsibility perspective. Mm -hmm. My own organization is doing some very interesting work, and I'm just going to tell you about one thing, and that is a partnership that we have with Google, which is to develop an, a smartphone app that operates kind of like MapQuest, and it helps pastoralists in Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Kenya find the fastest path to green pasture land and water. Because with climate change, places where these herders, who depend on their cows and goats to live, the places where they've been going for millennia are now dry. Mm -hmm. And their herds were just dying off at an alarming rate. And so in partnership with Google, we were able to get the Google engineers to, divide, to develop this app which leads the herders to the fastest path using the same technology. It's satellite technology and hydrological data, and it, it leads them in the fastest time possible to green pasture land. And in one year, we've implemented it. The herd mortality rates have dropped by 50%. Wow. That's so it's amazing. been a tremendous payoff. That's amazing. Yeah. That's great work. Yeah. That kind of creative partnership between the private and the nonprofit development community is happening on an immense scale. And some of the most interesting developments, I think, have come out of that collaboration. The other last thing I yep. want to say is that I think it's that U.S. businesses recognize the importance of global competency as a key um, skill that they want their top leaders to have. And so companies like IBM, Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, I'm sure many companies here in New Mexico are um, investing in sending their top leadership to developing countries in partnership with organizations like ours, like CARE, mm -hmm. like the Peace Corps, in co-sponsoring development projects where their top leadership gets an opportunity to use their business acumen to solve a development problem. And they're working in collaboration with nonprofits that are able to make sure that the work is really locally sustainable and appropriate on the ground, right. along with um, government ministries and what have you that can make sure that, you know, that it's really going to have long-lasting benefit. It has direct and measurable impact on the performance of those top leaders, both in terms of their output but also in terms of their retention rates. 
IBM has a whole massive program. It educates, it, it sends 5,000 of its senior leaders overseas every single year to do this kind of work because yeah. it, it is proven to help. It makes a difference. There's some great companies doing some yeah. great work. Yeah, and they're members of USGLC. Yes. <laughs> okay, Carrie, just, just one comment it, 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 in two parts here, the bragging on the Air Force and my constituents. I, I've been to these Air Force bases and as the general reminded us, you said, I think, when we were talking before, you had 40 homes in your lifetime yeah. in the Air Force. Yeah. I mean, these, these men and women in the Air Force are incredible, and the families, and how they, they move from one place to the other in defense of the country. And New Mexico is particularly welcoming. As the, my bragging on my constituents is out when, when we almost uh, – it had shut down Cannon Air Force Base. We had this big effort and all the political leaders in New Mexico fought and we saved Cannon. The most poignant story that I heard was a, was a uh, veteran that had retired. He'd done his entire time in the Air Force and, and he talked about the community of Clovis Portales and out there in eastern New Mexico and he said, you know, I've served, he wasn't quite as uh, mobile as the general, he said, I've served in 25 uh, countries around the world, and I served in this Air Force Base here, and he said, when I decided to retire, he said, this community, I felt, was the one that loved me the most, so I came back here and retired. <laughs> so, so it, it, it all, you know, it goes both ways. Yeah. It goes both ways. I, just one other quick, and I, and I know we're getting short on time. We may be out of time. I don't know. Um, but I, I will say, uh, and, and i got to make a pitch for the National Guard, uh, around the country, but, but certainly here. Our, our guardsmen and reservists have really been um, drafted into pretty close to full-time use. And when you look across the broad diversity of the men and women who serve in your guard and in the, our, our reserves, they bring some of these soft skill sets that, that uh, we, we don't have lots of in the military. So agriculture and law, uh, rule of law and some of these places, we've relied heavily on our guardsmen and reservists to, uh, to help with that. And of course, every one of your bases today has a substantial number of people deployed. Yeah. And they're out there in Africa, they're in the Middle East, they're in South America, they're in Asia. And uh, lots of them aren't doing what they signed up to the Air Force for doing. They're, they raised their hand and said, send me in, coach, because I think I can help set up these runways in a country in Africa. And I, I think you have to, uh, those stories don't get told as much because it's five people or 12 people or eight people. But really you're making a huge difference globally. And in most of those cases, they're not there fighting and shooting. They're there building relationships and building a, 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 a culture of education and growth in, in that country. So uh, hats off to all of that. And by the way, the Cannon Community Support Group is, is known throughout the country as the model to shoot for, for how you support your military base. So, so General, you are correct. We are out of time. But I don't want to end this conversation without asking this one last question, uh, because I do think it's important. But I'm going to ask you to shorten your answers as, as quickly as possible. And this is what I call, it's a wonderful life question. Uh, we know that the character George Bailey got to see what his life would look like um, from a you know, hindsight perspective. And so I want to ask each of you, and again, very quickly, what would the world look like today if America wasn't taking the lead? So, General, I'll start with you. It, it would be a disaster. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I don't say that from a partisan side. If you look at the, at the diplomatic the, the economic, the military strength of our nation and the presence of our leadership globally and the historical benefit that the U.S. Uh, presence and leadership has, that has, has, has created, the, the environment it's created since the beginning of the, of the 20th century, uh, there, there is no way the United States can step away from that leadership. If you also ask every one of the nations in the world, something's happening, the very first question, whether they're our friend or they're not our friend, the very first question they'll ask is, what's the U.S. going to do? Right. Because they base their strategy either for or against based on what the U.S. does. If we step away from that, we will create voids that will be filled by all the wrong people 
in this world. Carrie? I say, for all the reasons the general has just said, you know, U.S. has a relationship with nearly every country in the world. Think North Korea. That's what the world will look like. Right. It's the only country where we don't have really strong programs. And so that, yeah. that's my answer, North Korea. That's yeah. what the world will look like. There you go. There you go. I, I would uh, I totally agree with both of them. Disaster. Uh, we don't want to go down that road. But I, I would just end by reminding us that, you know, we are one planet now, and we're all interconnected. And as we see the, the big forces that play out, whether it's global warming or drought and floods and the migrations, uh, whether it's uh, um, the, the dislocations that are being caused by war or whatever, all of that we can only handle and get through and be more peaceful as a world if we all work together. Yeah. And, and I just really believe that's what this coalition's about. What, what you all are about, and everybody here in this room is about, uh, is trying to make sure that we can strengthen uh, the relationships that we have uh, and move forward rather than going back uh, into some kind of disaster situation. Thank you very so, much. So Thank just you. like George, just, we don't want to go there. Right, <laughs> right exactly. We don't want to go there. Well, thank you. I want to say thank you to our great panelists here. It's been a dynamic, wonderful conversation. So thank you very much. Yeah. Now I want to invite our Western Outreach Director, Ash Harden, to close out our program. Good afternoon. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ash Harden. I'm the Western Regional Outreach Director for the USGLC. Thank you. Um, and the very proud organizer for New Mexico. Uh, and I'd really like to thank our panel, Senator Udall, General Winuart, and Carrie for leading us in such an important and timely discussion. Senator, we're so grateful for your leadership and support of U.S. development and diplomacy programs. And we're fortunate to have a champion like you representing New Mexico and D.C. And thank you to Secretary Fox, Jim, and Jason for um, rounding out our program today. And thank you, Carrie, for leading us in such an excellent discussion. I just want to give our speakers one more round of applause. So part of my job that I love the most is working with leaders like all of our speakers uh, and all of you. So thank you so much to our New Mexico Advisory Committee and our event partners who helped make this possible. Uh, so many of you are doing such incredible work. It's a very great reminder that Albuquerque is truly part of the global community. And I know I speak for all of us when I say that this was an informative discussion on how development and diplomacy help ensure our national security and advance our economic prosperity here at home in New Mexico. So what's next? I invite you to join us in our journey to support development or America's commitment to global development and diplomacy. We aren't asking for your money or a lot of your time. We're asking for your voice. When Senator Udall and the rest of the Mexico delegation stand up against isolationist voices in Congress, send a note, say thank you. It really matters. And if you are a veteran, join and encourage your fellow veterans to become a part of our Veterans for Smart Power initiative. We need game changer voices like yours. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest in development diplomacy programs. And share what you learned here today with your friends, your family, your colleagues. You are part of an important movement around the country, and we want leaders in your community to join us too. Now, I try not to ask a lot of you, but you know when I do, it really matters. And because it's never too early to start thinking about it, we hope you'll consider joining us in Washington, D.C. for our annual State Leaders Summit. It's two full days of exciting speakers, networking, and also visits to your delegation on Capitol Hill. I look forward to continuing our partnership in New Mexico, and thank you again for joining us. <laughs>